Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for the May edition of Three Squares. We're recording a little bit early this month to allow everybody to have a long weekend for Memorial Day. We hope you do as well. I'm Charlie Arnott with the Center for Food Integrity and Look East, dedicated to keeping food trustworthy. My colleagues on today's show, Susan Schwally and Kevin Ryan. Hi, Susan Schwally. I'm with Circana, where we help the industry understand the complete consumer. And I am Kevin Ryan with Malachi Strategy and Research, helping CPG and retail companies uh, through the front end of innovation. Are there actually any complete consumers, Susan? I mean, I'd like to feel complete, but I'm not sure. Can Sarkana help with that as well? Or is They that cannot book? complete you, but they, they can understand you completely. Mm-hmm. Ah, mm-hmm. okay. All right. I was a little, I was a little you have to find your missing that. piece, Charlie. No one can do that but you. <laughs> All right. Well, we are very, very fortunate today. We're going to be talking about gene editing. It's a it's a topic about which I have some passion. And uh, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about why. I think this technology has incredible potential to address some of the most pressing challenges we have in food and agriculture, whether it's our impact on climate, uh, nutrition, keeping food healthier, making uh, food more nutritious, extending shelf life. The list goes on and on and on. There are more than 500 products in development. Uh, about three products on the marketplace. And our topic today is really timely because Pairwise this week introduced a new leafy green that is gene edited that is just coming on the market right now. So it's incredibly timely. And we are very, very fortunate to have one of the leaders in gene editing with us today, uh, Natalie D. Nicola from Benson Hill. Uh, she is the chief corporate affairs officer, works closely with the CEO and the executive team at Benson Hill. They are an early stage technology platform company that empowers innovation to improve food and agriculture. I've had the pleasure of knowing and working with Natalie for a number of years. And prior to joining Benson Hill, she was president of Dinacola LLC, a senior associate of the Context Network, where she leveraged 20 years of experience in the agri-food industry and a decade of experience in sustainability and agriculture development to achieve business goals and address social, global, and environmental challenges. Natalie, thanks for joining us today. Oh, thanks for having me. Great to be here. Yeah. So we're excited about gene editing, the potential. As I said before, there's just a couple of products on the market today, uh, 500 in development. The way I describe it is we're kind of at that stage of the tsunami where all the water has been sucked away from the beach. It's building the wave. And sometime in the next couple of years, it's going to come crashing on the food system with all of these different applications coming to market in a relatively short period of time. So we'd like to learn a lot more from you. So Susan, I'm going to turn it over to you and we'll kick off the questions. Yes. Although I hope the tsunami is not destructive. I was going to say, like, Charlie, Charlie I needs know. a better. I, 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 I do. Need, I need a more friendly analogy. We, I know. Be? We just need a soft but positive landing. <laughs> well, so. I was letting Susan. I was letting you take that. I knew it's you. Okay. I was in my mind, but I was like, I don't want to attack Charlie. Maybe, maybe, maybe Dude. I should be like, it's the gates open to the Super Bowl, and the fans come pouring yeah. in. <laughs> There you go. Favorable, a little less, a little less destructive, perhaps. Okay. Perhaps. All right. I'll take it. It's good. All right. All right. Well, Natalie, thanks for joining joining us. You have been in biotechnology for more than 20 years. What is it about gene editing that you found find exciting? And is this how does this rank in terms of the excitement that you've experienced? Yeah. Where's gene exciting. editing at for you? Well, um, yep, I've been working in this industry for a really, really long time. Um, I did not start out in ag. I am a environmental toxicologist who learned early on how important food and agriculture was to the to the planet. So I got pretty involved and um, spent a good deal of my career with one of the big seed companies that was really advanced using advanced technology and plant breeding and also transgenics and doing a lot to improve the efficiency of food production, which is quite important, you know, to be getting more more productivity per acre and per gallon of water and so forth. But a big part of my job, I led sustainability there, and a big part of my job was talking to different organizations that weren't actually from agriculture. So consumer groups, um, uh, environmental groups, hunger agencies, and so forth. And um, in some cases, there are some really, well, there are a lot of strong opinions about biotechnology, as people saw it. And um, I think a lot of people interpreted a lot of the controversy, frankly, as anti-technology. What I had kind of the privilege of spending a long time sort of trying to unpeel that onion and understand what was behind it, it was less about technology as an issue. It was more 
trying to better understand what they're using, what we're using technology for and how the technology works to some extent, a sense of it, you know, being transparent about it and so forth. What's so cool about gene editing, I think, is that um, in my mind, it is combining the best of, a, of decades of research on how we can help make plants, um, leverage plants to feed everyone in a healthy, sustainable way. The benefits of plant breeding, more traditional breeding, is that you know, you're drawing on all this natural genetic diversity that's within the crop. Transgenics was actually taking a gene from a totally different species and putting it into a crop. Um, so it's really quite different. And I think when you talk about biotechnology, people always think of that. What's cool about gene editing is that it's actually an advanced form of plant breeding, where again, you're drawing on the natural gen genetic diversity that's within the plant. But whereas plant breeding takes like generation, like decades, frankly, and generations and generations of growing and so forth. Um, and you're shuffling the whole genome essentially each time, all the different genes, and you're trying to get the combo you want. Gene editing is enabling us to get, you know, very, very precise changes um, within the plant. And in many cases, restore a lot of the genetic diversity that we've lost over time. So one of the great things about the work we've done in our food system for the last few decades, like I said, make it way more efficient, we have a very efficient commodity system, but we have been breeding and, and essentially, you know, all the genetic innovation has largely been focused on yield and productivity and quantity, which is so important to keep food affordable and so forth. But we frankly have had to make some trade-offs on quality and things like nutrient density, things like uh, flavor have sort of been bred out. So gene editing is one of the tools that's going to enable us, is, is enabling us to restore a lot of that genetic diversity, um, essentially bring in the best that we can out of, like leverage the best we can out of these plants as we're trying to meet all of our different challenges. There's a fellow who's a scientist at UC Davis, very active in the climate world. I, he's just amazing to me. And what he describes it as, we had a you know, we had an era of mechanization in agriculture and food. We had an era of chemistry. And now this is really the era of biology. And I see gene editing as one of the most um, exciting tools that's gonna help us really experience a very exciting era of biology in the next few years um, when we really need it. You know, I think one of the other things, Natalie, that will help lead to acceptance, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute, is, you know, for generation one, when you were talking about biotechnology and GMOs, it took a decade and a hundred million dollars to bring a product to market. And that meant that only the very largest multinational companies could do it. This technology has been democratized because it has been made much more affordable. You've got private institutions, academic institutions, public institutions, all in the development world, which is, I think, will also help with acceptance because people will be working on things that don't have to have the same level of scale or the same volume to be economically viable. And I think that's gonna be really, really powerful. I'm so glad you raised that. That's so true. I mean, our company is one of those you know, early stage companies. There's a number of them. And um, we have different business models, frankly, than some of the traditional big seed companies. In many cases, we're not really seed companies. We're food tech companies, very focused more on these consumer traits and not only on the farmer-centric traits. Both of them are important. The other piece of it, the other dimension of that that's exciting is, um, you know, traditionally only a few crops really got advanced genomic attention. And... Um, this technology is enabling us to bring, you know, more improvement to a much wider diversity of crops. And that's super exciting for the food system as well. Yeah, Natalie, so you mentioned that about the model that you use. So, you know, I know Benson Hill, the, from the little amount that I've read about it, that it's a closed loop model. Um, can you talk a little bit more about why that's important to farmers or for the end, you know, a food manufacturer for the food companies? Sure. So, um, the genomic engine we built combines data science and plant science, which a lot of companies have done, tr traditional seed companies have done. We layered on the dimension of food science. And so what we're really trying to do is understand not just what the farmer needs, but what the consumer and the food and ingredient companies serving consumers, what they're looking for. 
and um, you know, consumer sensory data and so forth, you know, all different formulation data that the food companies are using. Normally, when you did plant breeding, none of that information that was from like the far side of the value chain, it's a very siloed value chain from a plant breeder to a seed company, to a farmer, to a grain processor, to an ingredient company, to a food company, to a consumer, retail and to consumer. Heck, how many, like it's so siloed. And so what we recognized is by actually creating a closed loop that connects all the way from the breeder, all the way through to the, the consumer, we were able to do a few things. Um, we were able to fuel that genomic engine I just described with sens consumer sensory data, food formulation data, as well as environmental data and agronomic data. We were able to look at our food system as a system. And so we were able to say, what kind of benefits can we create in the plant up front that's actually going to unlock cost or um, sustainability savings or reduce the need for masking agents way down at the other side of the chain? And um, so we developed these different crops with the consumer and the farmer in mind. Then we recognized as well manufacturing, like bringing that tech forward into the ingredients that the actual food companies buy is the way that we're really able to get the whole market going and bring this sort of different kind of thinking around what food innovation looks like. It's really exciting for the farmer because, you know, farmers are a very essential partner to us in the system. They're not our customers. So our goal isn't like mm -hmm. we're just trying to sell them seed. We're actually partnering with them they grow the seed we have and we buy their harvest back at a premium. And then we manufacture that into ingredients that we sell. And mm -hmm. part of what this enables the grower to do is to participate in that value add beyond the farm gate that frankly, they haven't really been able to experience before. Mm -hmm. So it just, we're, we're finding we're creating a lot more efficiency in the system. We're identifying new opportunities to create value within the system. We're sharing more of the value across the system. And on top of it, it's enabling much more traceability of food all the way back to the farm, which is something we see consumers interested in. That's very cool. Very cool. Okay. This is kind of a two-parter. So the Benson Hill technology can be applied in a number of ways. I had the pleasure of touring and, and learning a little bit about it. Um, so with more than 500 applications, you know, what's the most exciting next application for Benson Hill? And then stepping back from Benson Hill, what do you think are some of the most interesting applications being developed that will bring direct benefits to consumers? Sure. So one of the things we have on the market right now that was through traditional breeding or predictive breeding, not through gene editing at this point, but we're improving upon it using gene editing is just enhancing the protein level within the soybean. So we recognize, we, we focus a lot on protein, soy and yellow pea are really essential crops. Um, as we've been breeding soybeans for yield, we've actually been decreasing the protein levels as a industry. So we have been increasing the protein level and what that allows us to do, going back to like unlocking value in the system, a lot of markets that use soy protein, whether that's we think of things like, you know, alternative meat, but actually soy is in all kinds of food products, bakery and all kinds, your know, Taco Bell taco, all kinds of things, um, or different industries like aquaculture, which is they're trying to use more soy. So they're not actually having to feed fish fish, you know, to be more sustainable. One of the things we can do when we eat, increase soy expression in the, in the plant itself is we can skip a concentration processing mm. step they need to do right now. So right now they take soybeans, commodity soybeans, you crush them. And then you have to go through this very water and energy intensive processing step in order to get the level of protein that food companies need in order to make different ingredients or aquaculture companies need to feed fish. When you start with higher protein in the plant itself, you can disintermediate that step completely and mm -hmm. see like 50 to 90% uh, reduction in carbon dioxide equivalent, like a 70% reduction in water, you save money. It's pretty exciting. Um, and we've partnered with you know, some of our customers like Kellogg's for instance, some big aquaculture customers. Um, our products right now, some folks want um, a non-GMO kind of approach in Europe and we're trying to provide that through some of these traditional techniques. 
but gene editing is part of our pipeline as well to keep drastically improving the protein content as well as reducing some of these like anti-nutrients that cause like digestibility problems for the for the fish. So we have kind of these two different engines going. And um, I think these gene edited versions will be um, able to use on a lot more acres and um, for a lot of different markets. Excellent. And then outside of Benson Hill, what gets you excited among that list of 500? Yeah, right. Well, this whole flavor space, I think, is pretty amazing. And I'm glad you mentioned Pairwise. I was going to mention them because it's super exciting what they've done with the mustard green, basically knocking out the bitter, you know, the bitter profile. I feel like um, we're just sort of tapping into what's possible on this flavor side. There are so many different crops that... Um, have really great nutrient to tolerance, really great resiliency and things, but we haven't been using them very much because of things like, um, you know, flavor problems. One of the ones we're focused on, of course, is yellow pea, as I mentioned. Um, and what I think is really cool about that is right now, you know, this commodity system's been great to, but it's largely been designed to feed animals. And yet it's the same, you know, choices that the food companies have to work from. And so when you have all of these different products coming out that are really focusing on enhancing flavor from the beginning in a lot of different crops, I think it's just gonna open up so many opportunities for formulation, um, you know, just different kinds of approaches to formulation that folks haven't had before and a lot less need for salt and sugar and other kind of masking agents. I remember when I was consulting that I mentioned to you one of the people in a big, or that you mentioned in the bio, one of the big food companies um, had someone who was, he's basically is like, hey, I've got to come up with like more healthy and sustainable snacks. And I've like tweaked the formulation and improved the packaging all I can. I need better ingredients. And that's what I'm really excited to see is going to be coming. That's very cool. Can't wait for that to happen. That is super cool. So speaking of the consumer, because that's the area that I've focused my career on is understanding consumer behaviors and needs. First of all, because I understand the complete consumer, I know Charlie really wants you to make a better kale so that it will be palatable. <laughs> he absolutely does. And he Kevin does also wants an improvement on kale so you don't have to massage it <laughs> Yeah, in order to be edible. I personally would like you to put the flavor back in strawberries and tomatoes. So <laughs> Let me know when that's coming. But in all seriousness, we know that there's a lot of confusion about GMO, acceptance, not acceptance. Now we have gene editing. Now we have culture-based meat. Like, how do you break through? Like, how do you help the consumer, I guess, maybe understand and accept this technology? Yeah, it's such a great question. Um, well, to be, I mean, my my perception of it is, as I look at consumers today, and especially sort of the younger generation, I think there's just like, way more recognition that we're under so much stress in so many ways on our planet and the food system is no different and we need tools and technology to do it better. So I think there's just an increasing sensitivity around climate change and those sorts of things, way more connection to, you know, what you eat and your health. Um, I think the inflationary pressure is going on. There's just a sense more awareness, I think, of the pressures on the food system and a bit more openness around, okay, I got technology in all these different parts of my life. Why shouldn't it be part of how we're going to make food, you know, how we're going to feed all these people and do it in a sustainable way? What is critical is that we really lean into and try to understand what transparency and choice look like and embrace that as an industry and um, one, of, one of the things I'm very happy for is that a lot of the products you we're talking about here are very focused on consumers and bring direct benefit that they can, you know, you could really easily appreciate what that means. You know, if you have a technology that's benefiting a farmer, I would definitely argue that it brings benefit to a consumer, but it's not quite as easy to under, you know, to kind of make all those connections. And I think as we see more and more products come out that make this real, they see the benefit of those products um, and that we're willing to really be part of a conversation about the benefits, the trade-offs, you know, why we did it this way, what that looks like. I'm really grateful to Charlie and his team um, at CFI that have done a lot of work to 
really bring the industry together. And by industry, I mean everyone, academics, um, environmental groups, consumer groups, as well as you know manufacturers and so forth across the value chain to really think through, okay, what are the different ways that we can be transparent about what we're doing? What are the kinds of questions consumers have? What are the ways we can get that information out there? How can we have the kind of dialogue that's necessary? I think that's going to be really critical for us to keep doing as an industry. Great. And Emily, right, we have time I, for one more question, then we're going yeah. to go to the quiz. Kevin? Yeah. So, I mean, I work with a lot of companies, uh, you know, CPG companies and looking at innovation. And so I'm glad that you brought up the idea of like the high protein P and then like that conversation you had with the developer that said they need more and better ingredients, you know. Can you give us some examples of other stuff that that you're excited about that's coming that you know that may be used for food manufacturing using this technology? Well, I'll give you an example of um, a, you know someone involved in it, which is ADM. Yeah. So we entered into this large um, partnership with ADM, one of the largest human food protein you know manufacturers in the world, um, carrying these high protein soybeans I talked about. The way they talk about it, which we're, you know, and they have so much expertise in ingredient formulation and so forth. And they see this as sort of a new frontier of ingredient innovation for the whole industry. Yeah. You have a lot of the food companies and others, they're looking to innovate and figure out how they can bring, you know, new and better products to the consumer. And so when we're able to kind of expand the toolbox through different kinds of ingredients, that's opening new doors for them. I think the other is, um, I see a lot of the CPGs being pretty sensitized around sustainability and appreciating that um, there's a lot more stickiness with consumers when they're being transparent about their sustainability goals and their progress against them. And what we're what what I'm really excited about is the way that you know these kind of technology this kind of technology is bringing these direct kind of benefits that in many cases, we're doing it through this closed loop model with traceability. We're able to package that you know, improvement up into to show how these CPGs are meeting sustainability goals. Um, we have big players involved in it at this point. It's sort of like, in my mind, kind of a new day. Again, this era of mm -hmm. biology, of trying to solve problems in the food system, You know, making gene editing allows us to make plants that are better from the beginning to solve downstream food food challenges. So before we get to the quiz, we do have a couple of questions that came in. One, uh, isn't some of the protein and cereal grains also related to the soil fertility as well as genetics? Yes, there are many things that contribute to the quality of products that come out of the field. Second question from Aaron, I think this one is particularly important to address, Natalie, in the, in the closed loop model. This is a great model to bring more value back to the farm gate. How specific are the grower prescriptions for care of the growing crop? Mm -hmm. Great question. Mm -hmm. um, really what we do with our grower partners, one is we've identified some of the practices that can help optimize protein expression within the plant. So we give them those recommendations. Um, and the other thing we do is offer them regenerative ag kind of support and expertise. It's not a prescriptive thing that we're doing, but it's basically, like I said, a partnership with them. What we find is they're really interested in, they love the idea of growing for sort of these downstream benefits, and they like understanding what are some of the practices they can do that are going to help um, them contribute, not just to their own profitability, but what these downstream consumers are looking for. Great. And if you have questions, if you're not listening to the to the podcast live, you can always send them to three squares mail at gmail.com. That's the numeral three squares mail at gmail.com. We'll do our very best to get to those. And uh, I'm sure Natalie would be happy to respond to some as well if you've got questions you'd like to send. So send those our way. We'll do our very best to get to them. Uh, we're going to transition the, to the quiz. Kevin's going to leave that. Natalie, you're welcome to stay. Don't be surprised if Susan starts weeping at some point during the quiz because I, she's just so tired of losing. I'm the every winner. Every single time. You know what winners do? Winners win. <laughs> winners win. Okay. Well, let's see what happens, Kevin. Okay. Yes. What are we doing today? Uh, we are going to talk about, I mean, a complete transition over into, you know, fun and whimsical. 
uh, we're going to talk about refreshing beverages, like just like a, it's just a quiz about refreshing beverages. You know, we're, we're coming upon the, the heat of summer pretty soon in some places probably already. So I thought it'd be kind of fun just to kind of do a quick quiz to see what you know about uh, refreshing beverages. Lemonade. So, that is the first question. See, wow, look see, at that. See, many yeah, but not sp specifically. Okay, so let me let me let's get started. So, um, first question: Pink lemonade is believed to have been invented how? Is it a when a circus carney drops cinnamon red hots into a vat of lemonade? Mm. Is it B as a marketing gimmick by Mattel for the national launch of Barbie in 1959? Is it C? It was originally made with a rare pink lemon called the rose lemon. Or D, was it because during the Great Depression, the pink color was added to cover up less than good quality ingredients? Wow. Oof. So it wasn't, it probably you didn't say anything about pink. I thought maybe she introduced it, but no. No. <laughs> no. Oh, Charlie, yeah. it's older than that. I'm going with the Depression. I'm going, going with, with, I'm going with Barbie. Okay. Natalie, uh, Natalie, I don't know if you want to if you want to come in. I was going with the depression too. You are all incorrect. It is oh. a circus carny drops cinnamon red no. hot into a bag of lemonade. No. Yes, not for that, sure. There's, you made that's, that's, that's there's so two. Lame. There's two potential stories, and they're both involving the circus. One is the cinnamon red hot, which is great because it's like okay, that's fine. It's the other one like is that, that somebody wrote uh, like used the same liquid to make the lemonade as they had washed red trousers in. So that's the other Ew. that's the other story. But that's the two accepted stories, but they're both involved the circus. So, so apparently still circus. winning. Okay, next question. Two, <laughs> two, two, two people on, on the webinar have adolescent adolescent boys. When I was an adolescent boy, I used to think that working on the midway at the carnival or the state fair would be the best job ever. Yeah. Right. That would have been so cool. Yeah. 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 And, yeah, I th the carnival was kind of cool when you're. Yeah. When My you're son a thinks yeah. being a YouTuber and owning a Lambo by age twenty. Right. Yeah. 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 Well, there you go. Different dreams. Um, number or uh, number two. Um, after Niels Bohr won the Nobel Prize for discovering the structure of the atom, which I'm sure we all know, uh, what other beverage-related prize did he receive? Did he a get his own whiskey distillery? Did he B, get a lifetime supply of instant coffee? No searching, Susan. No searching. C, did he get yeah. the rights to a Coca-Cola bottling plant? Or D, did he get a house with unlimited free beer? He, he won this after he won? After As part of the prize, like, you know, it was like a kind of like someone else gave him a prize along with the <laughs> Nobel Prize. He got a beverage-related uh, okay, so prize. He a distillery, whiskey distillery, a lifetime supply of instant coffee, a Coca-Cola bottling plant, or a house with free beer. I'm going to go completely whimsical on the house with free beer. Susan? A Coca-Cola bottling plant? Natalie? I guess I'll go with the coffee. You could choose. You don't have to. You know, you could choose another. Uh, <laughs> actually, Charlie is correct. It Dang is a it. house yes! with unlimited free beer. Not only that, but because he was Danish, <laughs> it's the Danish beer giant Carlsberg. Oh, oh they go. had a laboratory house next to the bottling area. Oh, they just it wanted was, him nearby for it was a house with plumbed in beer, like <laughs> in the pipes. And he moved in there. It was literally a tap in the house. And he lived there with his family for 30 years. And never again invented or discovered anything. <laughs> anything. Because he was so completely anything. drunk all the time. Yeah, so, yes. so essentially, it's a fraternity. Yeah, pretty much. This right. was the man yeah. who actually won the Nobel Prize along with Albert Einstein. So, wow. yeah. Good yeah. company. Yeah, right. Okay. Okay, Charlie, you're up. Thanks. Okay, so. Although we, we, should, we should mention that that. Gene editing actually was responsible for a Nobel Prize as well. Jennifer Dowden at UC Davis won there the Nobel go. Prize. See how we're connected. We're discovering CRISPR. Yeah, I don't <laughs> think she's had it. free beer. As far as I probably know. not, but that's that could be a really good prize. That more people could invent things if they had the ability to get a house with free beer. Yeah. Um, next one. Kool Aid was originally called what? Was it called Zest Quench? <laughs> Sipsational? Fruit Smack? Or tongue tingle. I'm going fruit snack. Wait, 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 wait a minute. What was the first one? Something <laughs> zest, zest quench. Zest, zest quench. quench. Sipsational. Fruit smack or tongue tingle. I'll go sips sipsational. I'll take Natalie? Zest, quench. zest quench. 
Susan is correct. Yes. It was originally oh. called Fruit Smack. That was the original Fruit name. Smack. Fruit Smack. Fruit One of my Smack. favorite names ever. Actually, that's I love a really good name. Fruit Smack. It's a good I name. Like it name. is a good name. It, it was invented by a, a man who was like a door to door salesman and he invented fruit concentrate and he would sell it door to door in the 1920s. Fruit Smack. And it was originally that would be called a good Fruit Smack. Candy. Fruit Smack. Fruit Smack. Fruit Smack. Fruit Smack. I don't no, know if that think... means that the fruit is so strong it smacks you in the face. I don't know. Sure, it's like means. heroin. Maybe. Maybe that would be the other. Yeah. So you get a, you get you get an <laughs> apple with your heroin. It's better metaphors. <laughs> it's more like sour heads. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Oh. Maybe it was yeah, more yeah. sour back then. All right. And next I remember. One. I mean, when I'm old enough. You had to pour the cup of sugar actually in with the powdered yeah. flavor oh, yeah. to yeah. make your oh, yeah. Kool-Aid. So totally. it's, yeah, or add extra sugar if you really wanted to. Um. Go. Next one. What was the first Western soft drink sold in the Soviet Union? Was it <sighs> Pepsi, Schweppes, Coca-Cola, or RC Cola? Coca-Cola. RC Cola. Natalie? Uh, I'm going to go with mm, Coca-Cola. No, you're all wrong. It's Pepsi. Uh, Pepsi was the original one, and there's a long story on how they got in. But what the most interesting thing was that to get paid – Pepsi actually used to get paid in vodka from the Soviet Union as part of their payment. But then in one year, 1989, Pepsi was paid by the Soviet Union with 17 submarines, a cruiser, a frigate, and a destroyer. What? That, so for about a, a, a couple of days, Pepsi had the sixth largest Navy in the world <laughs> before they turned all those old <laughs> cruisers and submarines over to the Norwegian uh, Navy, who they turned it into scrap. It was their old stuff. So they basically bought it for, for scrap. Why so Pepsi had the sixth rules? largest Navy in the world well, for like a day, for like okay, a day. Yeah. And they were like really old, but this is fascinating that Pepsi actually worked through it because they were not going to get paid in rubles. They were going to want to get paid in something. So for a long time, sanctions or something. What boy, they were getting paid. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I and the, believe how the interesting this beverage yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, Kevin, really every, every episode, every episode Kevin yeah. has a quiz right. equally interesting. Yeah. All right. Last one. Last one. Okay. Wait, wait, what, what are we, what are we at? You're tied. One to one. One to one. Tiebreaker. What wedding related term has to do with beverages? Is it nuptials, honeymoon, eloping, or corsage? Honeymoon. Charlie says honeymoon. Susan? I was going to say honeymoon. That's fine. You can. You can. What is it again? Nuptials? Nuptials, honeymoon, elope, or corsage? Do, 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 do. I'll go nuptials. Okay. <laughs> Natalie? All right. I'll go then elope. Charlie is correct. It Dang is it, I should have stayed with honeymoon. So honey Once refers again. to the sweetness of it, but it also refers to the fact there was a European custom that um, newlyweds were given a month's worth of mead, which is honeyed wine. Oh. That way they didn't have to make it and they could have a whole month of Well, know, it also bliss. gave them the opportunity to, yeah, to be buzzed for a month while they got to know each other. <laughs> exactly. So, that so Charlie, Charlie's, Charlie won. Once again, I stuck with honeymoon. Again. We'd have at least been tied. <laughs> <laughs> well, Natalie, thank you for joining us for this silliness. Than me at least. Oh, we go. Were, great. I, we we thanks, look forward Natalie. to having you back sometime. We'll talk about the next <laughs> latest development from Benson Hill. So thank thanks for being so part of it today. Thank you guys so much for chance to talk. Yeah, 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 yeah. Great Thanks, to meet so you. So please join us again next month for the next edition of Three Squares. You can also tune into your favorite podcast platform, be it Apple or Spotify. And again, you can always reach out to us via email, three squares mail at gmail.com, the numeral three squares mail at gmail.com. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll see you again next time. Take care. Bye bye.